My grandmother um, used to tell me that when I was a young boy, I would ask her the question, Grandma, how can I be rich when I grow up? I don't remember asking that question. But I do recall seeing my grandmother as being well-to-do and being very generous, so I probably did ask that question. When I was in my 20s, I was working in the corporate world in Tokyo, Japan, and I was very ambitious financially. I remember at work uh, coming across an edition of Newsweek or Business Week magazine and flipping through it and coming to a table that showed what graduates from institutions like Harvard Business School and Stanford Business School were making at certain points in their career. I remember doing a comparison to myself and thinking, I'm doing really well here and feeling smug. I was making a lot of money, but it was also a deeply unhappy time in my life. And I knew I needed to make some changes. There can be all different kinds of forms of greed that a person experiences. A person can be greedy for attention and recognition. A person can be greedy for power and control. A person can be greedy for knowledge and information. A person can be greedy for new experiences and novelty. As we continue our series, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Living, we're going to be looking at how Jesus addresses the issue of greed. And in this particular case, he is addressing greed for money and material possessions. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 12, verse 13, we read these words from Scripture. Someone out of the crowd said, Teacher, referring to Jesus, Order my brother to give me a fair share of the family inheritance. Now, in this first century world, rabbis like Jesus were often called upon to weigh in on legal disputes and settle them. The eldest son typically received double what everyone else would get. And the proportion of an inheritance was fixed by law. And so, when this man is asking Jesus to arbitrate this inheritance matter, he probably has a sum in mind that he is legally entitled to. And I'm sure that people in the crowd were leaning in and eager to hear what Jesus would say. But interestingly, Jesus doesn't side with this brother or the other brother. Instead, he issues a warning. Jesus says, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then Jesus went on to tell this story. The farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. He talked to himself, what can I do? My, my barn isn't big enough for this harvest. Then he said, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barn and build bigger ones. Then I'll gather all my grain and goods and I'll say to myself, self, you've done well, you've got it made and can now retire. Take it easy and have the time of your life. Just then God showed up and said, fool, tonight you die and your barn full of goods, who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. Let's pray. Living God, by your spirit, we pray that you would use the words and the wisdom of Jesus to guide our lives, but to also shape our hearts. So we root them in something and in someone that is ultimately secure and who alone can bring it contentment. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, most people wouldn't describe themselves or think of themselves as greedy, but greed can be very subtle. The late, deeply wise pastor Tim Keller has observed that no matter what your social background or social class, greed can have a way of sneaking up on you and influencing you. Sometimes we think it's just the super, super rich that struggle with greed or mostly 
that class of people, but that's not necessarily the case. You can be poor and driven by greed to become anxious and obsess over matters of money as you worry about whether you have enough. You can be middle class and greed can cause you to become a kind of workaholic, working incredibly hard to make more money at the expense of your family life or relationships, friendships, at the expense of your spiritual life. You can be really wealthy and greed can cause you to live a more superficial life as you seek after luxury items or recreation or vacation in exotic places. And without knowing it, greed can wrap its tentacles around our hearts and deform us. And this is why Jesus spoke about money and material possessions more than any other social topic. And many of Jesus' teachings on money and materialism and greed were in the form of warnings. Let's go back to the story for a moment, but put it in a more modern form. A young software engineer, let's call him Alex, starts a tech startup. He and his team pour enormous amounts of energy and time into this innovative company. They then take the company public, and as the stock price soars, Alex joins the, quote, ranks of the wealthy elite. He's not worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Buys a palatial mansion on the ocean, begins collecting luxury cars and rare artwork. One day, Alex is at his desk working on a business plan, and suddenly his heart shuts down. And the next morning, he's found dead at his desk. At his memorial service, those who speak eulogize Alex as being a visionary leader, as being innovative, as being entrepreneurial, as being daring. He is lauded as a hero. But later that night, the angel of the Lord comes to his tombstone and with its finger, traces out four letters, F-O-O-L. And the person that Jesus describes in this passage is not called horribly evil by Jesus. He's called a fool. Why? Because this person felt that his vast wealth would somehow bring him happiness. Let's really live it up now, he says, now that we've got it made. But we know from experience, perhaps, and certainly from a vast amount of social science research, that that money alone will not bring a person lasting happiness. Uh, This person was a fool because... He was pouring all of this time and energy into harvesting his grain and building bigger barns to store more and more grain at the expense of his relationship with God and at the expense of his relationship with his family and and friends if he had them. And he was a fool, according to Jesus, because... He had accumulated all this wealth and then his life was going to be demanded of him. And he would leave how much of it behind? You know, sometimes when a really wealthy person dies, curious people ask, how much did she or he leave behind? And the answer is always all of it. All of it. As as has been described before, you never see a hearse dragging a U-Haul trailer. And so how can we avoid being described as a fool by Jesus, by God? None of us wants this description of us. And we can't simply 
sort of turn off a switch in our life to turn off greed. It's not quite that simple. But we can engage in practices that decrease the influence of greed upon our hearts. And what are those practices? What are some of them? Well, we can pray that we would be truly content in God. In 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, we read Paul write in Scripture, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. There is a persistent myth in our world that's hard to, to, to break, that having just a little bit more money will make us somehow happy and content. Uh, some years ago, my, my uh, wife Sakiko and I were in the Philippines, and while we were in Metro Manila, we happened to visit a place called Smoky Mountain, which isn't really a mountain so much as it is a literal garbage dump. I was just curious because I'd heard about this place, so we stopped. And while we were there, I remembered how a researcher had gone to Smoky Mountain and interviewed a man who was actually living on this garbage dump. And the, 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 the man was generating a little bit of income by collecting plastic and metals and, and then selling them at some uh, recycler. And, and the interviewer asked the man, living on this garbage dump, how much money do you think would actually make you happy? And the man thought about it. And he said, well, I think about 10% more than I'm making now. And then the researcher, sometime after, interviewed a very famous wealthy businessman whose name you would recognize if I uttered it, and asked him, how much money, you've got a vast amount of wealth, how much money do you think would make you happy and content? And this businessman thought about it and said, I think about 10% more. <laughs> Some of you may be familiar with the research of the, the late Nobel Prize winning economist Daniel Kahneman and his colleagues. So Kahneman and, 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 and their team were, were trying to figure out through research what was the relationship between income and happiness, felt experience of happiness. And based on their study, which was published in the National Academy of Sciences in the year 2010, uh, their, their research showed that a household income in wealthy urban areas of $75,000 was the saturation point. So beyond $75,000, um, the money beyond that would not add any additional units of happiness for people. Now, what was it for Canada? In a 2018 study at Purdue University, they pegged that number as $92,795, beyond which people would experience no additional units of happiness. Now, of course, we have to adjust for inflation, and we have to adjust for Canadian dollars. You know, the point isn't to be so fixated about a particular number, the, the, the point of the study or the, the, the key finding, as others have observed, is that once your, your basic needs are met, and if your basic needs aren't being met, if you can't afford your rent, if you can't afford uh, your groceries, then a rise in your income will raise your happiness level. But once your basic needs are met, additional income will enable you to go out to eat a little more often if that's your desire, drive a slightly newer car, but it won't add any additional units of happiness. And I think that's important to know and helps us break the myth of believing that more is always better. And a little bit more always means we will be happier. And so part of what we can do to decrease the influence of greed on our hearts is to pray and to seek for a contented, grateful heart. Each morning, as some of you know, I engage in a time of silence. And at the end of that silence, one of my prayers is inspired by someone named Dallas Willard, a great writer in the spiritual life. He didn't say this to me, but someone that I know, and I just sort of took it for me as well. 
Dallas Willard said to this person, arrange your life so that you are experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. And so I pray that for myself every day, that I would somehow be able to arrange my life so that I am experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence in my everyday life with God. And if we can cultivate a heart of gratitude, maybe through a gratitude practice of some kind, and we become more thankful, more content, uh, we will be freer of greed, and we will be more inclined to trust God and to live generously as Jesus calls us to. Right after this parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, uh, Jesus offers these words. Therefore, I tell you, he says to people in his world and to us, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? And who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? And Jesus here is saying, God feeds the birds of the air. And later he'll talk about how God clothes the lilies of the field that are here today and perhaps gone tomorrow. How much more will he feed and clothe you, O you of little faith? And then he says in verse 31, but seek his kingdom, seek God's kingdom. And these things, all that you need will be given to you as well. And I have found that these words of Jesus where he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, meaning his rule in your life, his loving reign. And all that you need will be given to you as well. I mentioned at the beginning of the service that back when I was in my 20s, I was working in the corporate world in Tokyo, making a good income, but also deeply unhappy. And I knew I needed to make some kind of change. At the time, as had been true from my student years, I was tithing, giving the first tenth of my income to, to the work of God. But I felt this doesn't represent any sacrifice to me, no faith. I, I need to give more to the work of God, to the poor, uh, to, to folks in different parts of the world. And so I started doing that. At the time, I was attending a very small church in northeast Tokyo. Most churches in Japan are very small. And as you may know, it's a cash-based society. So I was giving via cash without attaching my name to it. But the church was so small that the pastor figured out what I was giving. And he actually pulled me aside after a service and quietly said he knew about my hopes to one day go to theological seminary and maybe one day be a pastor. He said, I know that in the future you're thinking about being a pastor, so you need to stop giving now. He didn't say this, because your income is going to really drop, and you're going to need to stockpile so that your future will be secure. I was really grateful, because his heart was good. He was concerned about my future well-being and security. I didn't say this, because it would be rude in this culture to say something to an elder to kind of push back and, and this pastor was close to 80 and, and I just couldn't say this but I thought this I thought something like one day I may be in a position myself where it's my responsibility my privilege to invite people to actually trust God with their money and their things and I like to know from not just the Bible, I trust the Bible and respect it, but I'd also like to know on this matter whether it works through my experience. And so I knew that I could just stockpile money and then just completely fund my graduate education, but I wanted to give it a level where there would be at least some trust and faith involved. And so, so I did that. Eventually I get to graduate school, I get to seminary just north of Boston, and every semester, the funding comes in uh, that covers tuition through scholarships, grants, or part-time work. And then some of my savings um, covered the living expenses. I did 
engage in some savings, just to be clear. I finish grad school. I'm able to make it through. God has provided, but I'm pretty much at zero at this point, <laughs> uh, broke. And then there's another chapter that some of you are aware of that I, I feel an invitation to trust God in. I have a couple of different work options coming right out of um, theological um, seminary. One is a more conventional job. Another is to go to Southern California to help start a brand new church. And it's almost a voluntary role because the starting salary is $50 a month, which even if you adjust for inflation, isn't very much. It eventually goes to $200, but even that isn't much. And I don't have a place to stay and as I've shared with some of you, I, I arrive in Southern California and I'm contacted by someone that I've never met who says, I hear that you've come to Southern California to start a new church. My wife and I travel most of the year in our line of work. We're wondering if you would be open to living in our home free of charge in exchange for taking care of the house while we're gone. And by the way, we live in a home that overlooks the Pacific Ocean. Person says, I know you'll want to pray about this. And I'm like, I, I don't need to pray. I do, <laughs> yes. Uh, and in all kinds of ways, God provided during that time. And I know that God is faithful, not only in my head, but through experience. And I've observed this to be true for people that I personally know. John Mark Comer is, is a friend. He's also a wonderful teacher on the spiritual life. He describes that when his two boys were young and, and, and growing and they were considering as a family international adoption, that uh, they realized they needed a slightly bigger vehicle than their little Volkswagen. So they began to save and they, they saved up $15,000 for a slightly larger used vehicle. But they were working with this new international adoption agency, and all these unexpected fees were coming in and invoices. And one time, uh, John Mark said, um, they received a photo of this girl that it looked like they would have an opportunity to adopt if they chose to, and an invoice for $2,500. And he and his wife, Tammy, prayed about it and wondered, do we proceed? But as they prayed, they sensed God was leading them to proceed wrote the check for $2,500. Their car fund was now at zero. Tammy took the check and the final part of the application, went to the post office. And while she was at the post office, John Mark received an unexpected phone call from someone at his church who happened to own a used car dealership and said, you won't believe what just happened. Someone came and offered $15 thousand dollars as a gift in your name and it's non-refundable what are the chances very slim that it would just be pure coincidence come and pick out your used car i could repeat many stories like that when we entrust our lives to god it doesn't mean that we're going to become super financially wealthy necessarily it doesn't mean that we'll be super successful in a worldly sense but when we entrust our lives to God we will find that God can be trusted to provide all that we need and as we live that way as the Quaker writer Richard Foster once wrote giving frees us to care it produces an air of expectancy as we anticipate what God will lead us to give. It makes life with God an adventure of discovery. We'll also find that there's joy in this kind of living by faith and seeing God provide through us and for us. The sociologists Hilary Davidson and Christian Smith in their book, The Paradox of Generosity, wrote, people rightly say that money cannot buy happiness. But money and happiness are still related in a curious way. Happiness can be the result not of spending more money on oneself, but rather giving money away to others. The data examined here show this to be not simply a nice idea, but a social scientific fact. 
And many of us know this truth, the truth of Jesus' words, that it is more blessed to give than receive. The social science backs it up, but many of us know from experience that when we give, not just financially in an overt way, but maybe host someone for a meal, treat someone to lunch, or when we're generous in the way we interpret someone's actions, quick to forgive, sponsor a child, whatever. There is a, a joy in that experience. And it makes sense that when we mirror the most generous and joyous being in the universe, that we would then also reflect some of that joy. And so we can't just flip the switch on greed and, and, and easily turn it off. But we can engage in practices like praying that we would have a grateful heart, gratitude exercises, and trusting God with what we have and, and living generously that can help decrease the influence of greed in our lives. And when we give, we also bring joy to the heart of God. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, we read, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you've been around 10th for a long time, you may recall my sharing this story at a Connections dinner when we were a church with just one location, I used to host these connection dinners that Craig now appropriately hosts and our other site pastors host at their locations. But when I was uh, leading these, these dinners, sometimes I would share uh, a story that um, originates from Sakiko's family. When I was first meeting my in-laws in Japan, my future in-laws, it struck me that they had a real compassion and love for vulnerable animals. They took in some stray dogs and cats, uh, so they would have a kind of home. And uh, as I was getting to know uh, Sakiko, I, I noticed that she had a chipmunk in her apartment. Now, she didn't take this from Stanley Park, or, uh, Park in, in downtown Tokyo, just in case you're wondering. Uh, she clarified last night that uh, she actually uh, walked into a pet store and saw that there was a chipmunk that was clearly the runt of the pack, the smallest, seemed very weak. Uh, and, and so Sakiko wanted to take this chipmunk, bought it, brought it back to her apartment, and she was hoping and praying that the chipmunk would come to health and lead a, a, a life of, of, of flourishing as a chipmunk. And so she named him Forte, which uh, was reflective of the five stripes of a you know, musical score, and as you know, if your musical means strength in a musical context. Well, Forte started to thrive and became very healthy. And when Sakiko would come home from work, Forte would get all excited and start running figure eights. And if Sakiko was working late on her computer, Forte might run up and down the keyboard typing, you know, not knowing what, what Forte was typing. Sakiko noticed this, that Forte would take his most valued possessions, his walnuts, and store them where he slept, in the little hut where he slept. Uh, probably a kind of hibernation instinct. But Sakiko also noticed this, that as their relationship grew in trust and in connection, Forte started to take half of his walnuts and put them under Sakiko's pillow. He was observing where she was sleeping and apparently wanted to share we don't exactly know the precise psychology, or at least I don't, of a chipmunk. But the chipmunk was probably thinking, Sakiko is my family. She took me in. She has somehow provided for me. So I want to share. I want to make it really clear here that the point of the illustration is not to say if you feel God has provided for you, you give half of your wealth explicitly away. I am not saying that. The starting point for a tithe in the scriptures is, is 10%. So I'm not saying that. I am saying that when we understand that God has provided all that we need, and most of us aren't farmers, but if we were farmers and believed that the land is not really ours but God's, it would make sense that we would give the first fruits back to God. 
If we believe that our minds, some of us say, we worked super hard for what we have, but if we believe our minds were given to us by God and we're able to, in a manner of speaking, harvest our minds, it, it makes sense that we would give something back to God and, and to the poor and to those in need. If we somehow harvest something through our physical bodies and we realize that God has given these to us as a gift, it makes total sense that we would give something back to God and to the world as an act of gratitude, as an act of worship. And so giving can bring joy to God's heart, joy to our heart. It can foster contentment. And then finally, we can look to Jesus Christ as a way to overcome and, and live free of greed. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor for our sake, so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. Paul says, when you think about Jesus and how he voluntarily left the unimaginable splendor and wonder and glory of heaven to become one of us, a human being, and voluntarily chose to live this life of relative poverty, was born into a humble stable for part of his adult life, would have no home of his own, would be what we would describe as homeless. And after having lived a perfect life, a life without sin, Jesus voluntarily died on a cross, on a Roman cross, absorbing our sins in himself so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be adopted as daughters and sons of God, so that we might become wealthy in the only way that truly matters. When we realize all that God has given us, the only reasonable natural response is to say, God, I offer you myself and I offer you what I have as an act of worship. Let's pray together. If you want, you're welcome to pray what I'm about to pray, something that I pray every day. It's a prayer of recognition that God has given us all that we have, and it expresses a desire to offer that back somehow to God. It's a prayer written and prayed originally by St. Ignatius of Loyola in the 16th century. And it's a prayer that I pray each morning. If you want, you can pray it in your heart after me. God, you have given all to me. And if you believe that, you can pray that. God, you have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. And that simply means that you regard it as, as God's. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Guide me to be a good steward of what you have entrusted to me, a generous steward. And that doesn't just mean money, but it means our energy, our time, our heart. Give me only your love and your grace, for that is enough for me. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. And may it be so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.